Now, in order to use seismic waves to study the geologic activity and structures of the Earth, you actually have to have a device to measure it. And you also need these devices to measure the occurrence of the earthquakes and help to help us predict, analyze, and understand them. And so the device that's used to measure the earthquake activity is a device that basically sits to, on a platform and measures the amount of, of actual shaking laterally, vertically, or whatnot that happens with the surface. And we call this a seismograph. And one of the labs you can do for this topic is to create your own seismograph. And seismographs generate seismograms, which are basically um, lines in a piece of paper that trace the actual earthquake activity or the movement of the ground as the earthquake takes place. In other words, the actual arrival of the P, S, and surface waves. And you can see that in a seismograph, normally, the seismogram will, determine, will indicate that the P waves will arrive first, followed by stronger but slower S waves, followed by even stronger surface waves. And so you see how the propagation is actually going to be, there's going to be something called a lag time, as this, these waves will arrive at different times because they propagate at different speeds from the location of the earthquake. Now, in modern science, we actually use what we call three-component seismographs, and there's even some portable units, as you can see here. And it's called three components because they're going to analyze the way the ground is moving vertically as well as north to south and east to west. And so you're going to be analyzing a three-dimensional image of how the ground is moving. And so basically you get that by creating three different seismograms, one for horizontal east to west, one for horizontal north to south, and one for horizontal vertical motion. Notice, by the way, how the S waves barely create vertical motion. Mostly they create horizontal motion, all right, because they're causing the ground to move like a snake way while P waves are more vertical motion. So that means that the rolling part of the love waves is caused by the P wave, as well as the rally wave that makes the ground moving up and down. But the S wave is going to be creating the shear stress part of the surface waves. All right? But either way, the seismograph is definitely important. It's also through this device that you help locate the earthquake. Because you see, there's always a lag time, like we just talked about, between when the P wave arrives and when the S wave arrives, since the P wave is primary in the sense that it travels faster. It's easier to move the ground that way. Now, depending on how long it took for the S wave to arrive after the P wave, you can tell that this S wave was further. And the idea for this is basically that, let's say you have, for example, a guy sitting on a bicycle and a guy sitting in a Ferrari you know, right next to each other, and they both kind of accelerate at the same time. So ready, set, go. Stop. Within one second of the start, that means how far are both of them going to go? No, not very far. Sure, the Ferrari can make, maybe make a few um, dozens of meters or so, and the, the bike will definitely maybe make a meter or two or so, but the distance between them will definitely be different, right? However, what will happen if you say start, and then you wait three minutes, and then you say stop. In other words, if you allow the, this wave to travel further, then it will look like the distance between the, the, the Ferrari and the bike is going to be ridiculously bigger. So in other words, the shorter the distance between the P and the S wave, the closer to the origin it stopped or it hit you. So that means that the bigger the lag time is, the further you are from the source of the earthquake. And so that means you can use the lag time in minutes to determine the distance in thousands of kilometers from the source of the earthquake. And you, there's actually a graph that the, can be used to determine this because the, the, the speed that the P wave goes to the crust is pretty much constant throughout the crust. There's some variation, but it's pretty much constant. So you see, for example, that if the P wave arrives and one minute later, the S wave arrives, so that means if the epi the there's a there's a distance in of about a minute between the, the the two waves. So you try to find that there. So around here, for example, you will see about a distance of a minute. Okay, that means that the epicenter will, was last in the one thousand kilometers away. I'm sorry, but if the epicenter difference or or the time difference was many many minutes away. So for example, in this case here you have something in the order of 10 or 11 minutes away from each other. The P wave arrive.
wait several minutes, and then the S wave arrives. That will actually make it look like they, they are, you are actually very, very far from the epicenter, and that means over 9,000 kilometers away. And so stations across the world can determine how far they were from an earthquake that's being felt around the world because they can actually notice the, lo the location by realizing the distance and the lag time because remember Ferraris move faster than bicycles P waves move faster than S waves the longer you let them run the bigger the difference between is going to be so if you're far from the epicenter the longer they, you let them learn run and therefore the distance is going to be bigger and the minutes apart is going to be longer and that's how we find how, how, how far the earthquakes actually are now, if you actually compare the lag time of several different stations around the world, say, for example, an uh, earthquake happened, and Miami uses the lag time and says, well, that earthquake was 2,400 kilometers away. All right, 2,400 kilometers away. Then Dakar station says, well, actually, it was only about 900 kilometers away. And then Lima station says, well, it was 2,600 kilometers away. Now, you can, if you trace a circle around Lima, this earthquake could be anywhere in this circle. But it couldn't be anywhere in the circle because at Miami circle um, only matches the Lima circle in two locations. It only matches the Lima circle here and here. And so now you need a third station to help determine what's the final thing. And once you realize that the car station meets the other two only here, you can tell that was the epicenter. And then you can study how far, how, how much energy the 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 earthquake had at the epicenter to determine the focus or how deep the actual earthquake actually was along the epicenter. By the way, this earthquake was clearly because of the mid-ocean rage in the Atlantic Ocean since it's uh, right smack in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It could also have been a hot spot, but it looks to me like there would be a mid-ocean ridge oriented uh, earthquake. Now, that means that when you use tri triangulation by lag time, you're going to need at least three stations to help determine where the earthquake took place or what was the epicenter of the earthquake okay so with the three different stations you can find the location of the earthquake there is another way to find the earthquake though you can do it through the shadow zones remember that we talked about this in the last video there's some areas of the world that do not experience the earthquake because the waves do not travel through the solid so through the liquid outer core the s waves that is which creates the S shadow zone that extends for most of the world's surface on the opposite side of the epicenter. And you also have the P shadow zone, which happens because of the, of the refraction pattern as the waves hit the different layers of the Earth. And so, if I know I am over here, and that I did not feel the earthquake, and somewhere here, another station also did not feel the earthquake, I know the beginning and the end of the shadow zone, and I can use that to triangulate the position of the earthquake. In other words, if I know that earthquakes usually have this structure, um, I can find the epicenter by using the shadow zones because I know that the edges of the shadow zones are always 105 degrees away from the epicenter. And so you, if you find which stations around the world did not detect the earthquake, you can actually help find the epicenter. Now, even better, they can, this can actually help you pinpoint the focus of the earthquake. So it's even better than finding the epicenter. So by using both lag time of three different stations or finding your limits of your shadow zones, you can help find the location of where the earthquake came from.